Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eva, for this uh, invitation, for the generous introduction. Thank you, all of you, for being here. It's not as dreadful as it has been in the last three days, but it has that feeling that you'd rather have a cup of hot chocolate and stay home and and uh, read a book or do something else. So I, I'm really grateful to you all uh, for being here um, with us. Um, as uh, Eva uh, mentioned, I, I've written a number of books and predominantly my work is on the pre-modern period. So medieval, early modern, up to the 18th, late 18th century. And um, usually nobody cares about what I write. <laughs> And writing this book uh, was like living in a twilight zone. Be careful what you wish for. So my husband and I always joke that uh, he shows me, you know, ads in the New Yorker of books of the Renaissance, early modern music. You see, it sells. And, you know, my previous work, Jews and Catholic, Jews and heretics and Catholic Poland, sinners on trials, you know, no, nobody really pay attention. But this book, as I was writing it, um, it was, it was, uh, the, the twilight zone. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, because that story that I began with, or I thought I the book that I was, uh, I thought I was writing my typical book that maybe, 50 people would read, um, turned out to be sadly very relevant. I was finishing it at the, um, uh, just after, um, uh, in 20, 2018, um, it went into, uh, into production. And as the book was going into production, um, literally I had to stop the, um, um, the presses, so to speak, because a shooting took place in um, California near San Diego, and the San Diego shooter posted an online um, in his uh, uh, manifesto, anti-Semitic manifesto, um, justifying the murder of Jews in San Diego, in California, uh, with this uh, section here. And I highlight, so uh, blood libel, uh, is, is a motivation. And then he puts in brackets, you are not forgotten, Simon of Trent, the horror that you and countless children have endured at the hands of the Jews will never be forgiven for not speaking about these crimes, for not attempting to stop the members of their race from committing them. And finally, for the role in the murder of son of man, that is Christ. Every Jew, young and old, has contributed to these. But these crimes, they deserve nothing but health, and I will send them there. But the person, the 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 uh, outline, the underline section mentions this boy Simon of Trent, and that's what my book was about. He was the sort of principal organizing uh, character, and that is a story of um, uh, going back to 1475, when this boy named Simon, about just under three years old, um, was found dead on Easter Sunday, and that his death then led to the most notorious trial and then ultimate destruction of a Jewish community in this northern Italian town of Trento. Now, Trento, uh, Trient at the time, um, and, uh, and yet that 15th century story ended up motivating this shooter in 2019 in uh, San Diego. Um, so um, one of the... Um, and, and this was not just one of the examples, but you could see it that, that the past, that medieval and early modern, I'm using the scholarly jargon, early modern from 15th to 18th century, um, was something that motivated a, a certainly contemporary anti-Semites like the shooter, or, um, here we have a, British um, right-wing uh, white supremacists gathering at the um, in the Lincoln Cathedral at the supposed grave of uh, Little Hugh of Lincoln, um, uh, who was supposedly murdered in 20, uh, 1255, 
uh, and his death, again, the child's death, resulted in a trial and murder of Jews in, in the town of Lincoln in England. And since I'm speaking about the history of uh, in the, in the society of Czechoslovak, history of Czechoslovak Jews, I could not but mention um, the uh, 2016 incident where far-right Czech politicians visited the symbolic grave of a, of a, uh, a girl, Aneska Khrushcheva, uh, uh, and she, you'll hear more about her from Hillel Kival and his, his talk in October, um, who was, uh, again, found dead and murdered in um in 1900 um 1899 in Polna uh in in um uh, I think it's in, yeah in Czech in now Czech Czech Republic um in um Facebook had a had a, a page a community page re uh, devoted to Jewish ritual murder which was only taken down in 2018 after 4 years of ADL's effort to take it down uh and just uh, you know the Middle East the iconography and the references to the blood libel are ubiquitous in um in in anti-israeli cartoons and anti-israeli uh, rhetoric and then after my book came out uh uh, literally a month after my book came out in 2020, there was a big, uh, big scandal for those of us who follow uh, with this painting, an Italian painter known for his devotional art and um, and uh, commissions for various churches painted this atrocious painting commemorating, again, Simon of, of, of Trent, the boy that motivated the shooter in San Diego, whose death in 1475 led to the destruction of Jews in the city of Trento. So how did that medieval tale, these lies, ended up, they take, take such deep root that they speak to so many people across so many continents, and, and we see these references again and again um, uh, in, in our own uh, time. So first, the question is, is it a medieval tale? It does emerge in the medieval period. And here is a map. This is, these are screenshots of the maps on the website. So you can play with them. They are actually dynamic. You can, you can move things around and, and zoom in and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is the, um, the, the, the stories of Jews supposedly ki killing Christian children um, that emerges, the first such story emerges in, um, a, a, about the, a murder from 1144 in Norwich, England, although the story emerges decades later, but the death of that child uh, happened in 14, uh, in 1144. And um, I just took it to 1450 as a presumed end of the Middle Ages. So you have about you know, 20 something of these stories. The majority of them are from literary. So they are not necessarily facts. They are not necessarily telling of our real dead children. They are sometimes legends, rumors, tales um, that, that are not documented in any way but some one line in a literary work. Um, only Six of them, I think, here are shown, um, have any legal or extra literary uh, evidence. And these are usually either, as the Lincoln case, a trial and, and that ended up in the murder of, Jewish, uh, of Jews there, uh, or in letters um, defending Jews by the authorities. In the 13th century, we begin to see emperors, kings, and popes condemning Jews uh, condemning such accusations. And here is a list of papal pronouncements against accusing Jews of killing Christian children. The popes uh, and the, these many popes uh, explicitly said, do not uh, uh, accuse Jews of such, such atrocious things. Um, and giving all kinds of explanations why Jews would not do such things. So uh, yes, this emerges in the Middle Ages. Um, there is evidence and condemnations of, um, of such accusations against Jews in the Middle Ages. But is blood liable a medieval story? And let's take a look again in one of the maps. So this is a map that actually stretches to 1830. And if you look at the, 
at the bottom, this is the medieval period, and this is the early modern period. So we've seen that map for the medieval period looks pretty sparse compared to the map of the whole period. Now look at the map of the early modern period from 1450 until the 19th century. It's a very different map. There's a geographic shift, but there's also an intensity of it. The numbers increase, but also note that we have a different type of evidence that emerge. Not only just stories, lines, rumors, prayer, uh, prayers or poems or anything like that, but actual legal sources. So we, we can now tell that in these cases, Jews were subjected to trials, not just tales that were told about what they supposedly were doing. So we have lies, tales that then somehow are turned into facts and they are turned into facts often through these legal procedures. And we'll talk about it in, in a moment of how that happens. So, um, uh, so we have the proliferation of these trials, not in the medieval period, but in the early modern period. So why? Why is, why did that change? Why we have such shift in quantity and quality, uh, from the medieval to the early modern? So again, you can see here the, the source type uh, does not necessarily how it preserved uh, what happened here. But here you also have were there legal proceedings and the majority of them are no. We only have, oh, we hear that Jews killed that boy in Norwich or something like that. Um, in the early modern period, that's a very different story. We have legal sources, but we also know that there were actual trials of Jews. And in the very majority of these dots, of these instances, Jews were subjected to pr pros prosecution. Um, although interestingly, and this was a shocking thing when I created these maps, they were not Often, they often were actually released. In the me medieval period, we don't know much. But in the early modern period, the majority of the cases, Jews were actually freed. That doesn't mean they didn't suffer. Torture was a normal method of investigation at the time. But it means that in not all of these cases, Jews were actually executed and, and killed as a result of the accusations. Would we remember is that they predominantly were killed. And that is because it served the anti-Jewish writers to show that Jews do it. So they publicized the cases in which Jews were condemned to death and not the cases where that Jews were deemed innocent because that didn't serve them. So, the, not only do we have the increase of anti-Jewish accusations in the early modern period from four, late 1400s until the end of the 18th century, but we also have note the last papal condemnation is in 1548, 44. The popes would never again explicitly condemn Christians for, um, uh, accusing Jews of killing Christian children. And you can see that it had some impact. Those statements are not very effective, but they do matter because those who wanted to defend Jews could say, look, Jews don't do it. The popes said we shouldn't do it. So this, these are the number of accusations um, that took place uh, between the first condemnation by Pope uh, Innocent IV until the last one by Paul um, III. And here is the intensity of the accusations against Jews after the popes stopped condemning these accusations. And Jews were trying to reach, the, uh, reach Rome and have the popes reissue these, uh, these condemnations to no avail, and I'll, we'll, that we'll, we'll learn why. 
That's the reason why. The impact of that 1475 trial of Jews and the, the death of little Simon um, it, it had a ripple effect. So let me tell you a little bit about this trial. Um, so on um, the Passover started on Wednesday that, that week, um, Easter Sunday, so of the Holy, of Christian Holy Week. Um, and uh, Simon's body was found under a Jew Jew's home in, uh, on Easter Sunday. Um, the boy disappeared on Thursday, so second day of, pa of Jewish Passover. So even if you believe that Jews killed Christian children for taking their blood to, um, to use in matzah, which is obviously a lie and an absurdity, um, the chronology doesn't work. Um, he disappeared. Uh, initially, it is thought that he drowned in the, in the many canals that are in the town. And then um, it, the Jew's home was searched on a Friday. Nothing was found. And then on, um, on Sunday, his body washed up under the house of the uh, Jewish man um, Samuel, on, uh, who you see on this, on this woodcut. Um, the Jew Jewish men were uh, immediately arrested. Jewish women were, and children were put under the ha house arrest. And then the trial uh, happened. But before the trial even got started, before the first confessions under torture were made, the narrative was already created. And the narrative was already ready uh, a few days after J uh, Simon's body was found. So Simon's body was found on um, March 27th. Uh, and by March 31st, a whole narrative was already written, accusing Jews of, uh, of uh, killing Simon in, um, uh, in reenactment of the crucifixion of Jesus and, and casting Simon as a little baby Jesus uh, in this way. Um, you notice I'm showing you um, a, a, like a poster, a woodcut, a broadside from 1475. Here is a printed book, um, a, a little booklet that was printed right away. 1475 is just literally, I mean, it's, it's about two decades, but in those times, two decades was not, uh, was, was, was not such a long time. Uh, two decades after the invention of the printing press. So the local bishop and the local people immediately take the new technology and use it to pro propagandize this story. And they use it to very effective uh, 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 results. Uh, they visualize the tale. We have no iconography of the quote-unquote medieval anti-Jewish accusations from that map when you think it. There's no iconographic. Thing. They invent the, uh, the iconographic vocabulary, the way people imagine or think about Jews supposedly killing Christian children. They write stories they are mostly in Latin, but also in the vernacular, songs, tales. Um, they uh, pu put out pilgrims' po uh, po postcards because the local bishop wants to invite, you could say tourists, pilgrims into his town. 1475 is also a jubilee year. There are a lot of pilgrims going to Rome from all over Europe to cross the Alps they can come through Trento rather than Venice or other places. So this is the story of this new martyr, the new miracle child is now um, an, a magnet. And here you have a, a one of those posters showing the pilgrims coming and offering devotee for various healings. And uh, you can see the little boy as a, as a, as a martyr and the tools of the, his supposed martyrdom, like the tools of the martyrdom of the, of the death of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> the Pope immediately sends actually um, an envoy says, what on earth is going on there? Um, do, we are not supposed to, their popes have condemned this. He even sends a copy of the bull from, from uh, Pope Innocent IV. Uh, but when the envoy comes, 
Three days later, the Trentini, the people in Trento, published this work, the, the history of the Simon of Trent, the, uh, of Simon the Martyr, which is illustrated. It's the first, the story of Simon of Trent is also the first instance that we have images of Jews in print, not Jews from the biblical era, not some generic Jews, but of supposed real Jews uh, historically. So it's very significant, and we have them named, and they correspond to, to what we see. Uh, and the, the booklet is just 12, uh, 12 pages. Uh, the, the text corresponds to what we see on the, on the page. Uh, but that sets the narrative for when the, when the envoy comes, the story is out there. It's set. You can see, you can read. Um, now also in the vernacular. And here are just images to, so you get a sense of, of what it is. And it just tells the full story, um, of his, uh, of the boy's supposed martyrdom at the hands of Jews. The local bishop invested a ton of money in art, in hiring poets to write poems about the boy, um, in printing. He also made sure that the story enters Chronicles. Uh, this is the, uh, a, a chronicle uh, of the history of the world. Is a new genre, a new type of a book that is published in the late fifteenth century that tells the sto story of the history of the world from the creation through the biblical stories until the year when they publish. And the bishop wants to make sure that the story of Simon is in that history of the world. So he makes it as a fact that now in these various history, the Jews kill Christian children. That story enters this history. You probably may have seen this image. If you Google blood libel, ritual murder, that image will come up. This is an image from 1470, uh, 1493 from a German um, uh, chronicle of the world, the Nuremberg Chronicle, very famous. And the one image on the, on here is a pirated edition of that, of that book. Um, so, uh, and that again gives us the, the language, um, and people, people now can imagine that Jews do, do such things. So I traced in my research, these are my, my spreadsheets of all the chronicles that were published in Europe. I went at the New York Public Library year by year to see how the story and which stories are included in these various chronicles. And it, uh, and, 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 and it, it enters and it, it varies from, um, whether it's Latin, whether it's German, the language, whether it's in Italian, it changes a little bit of the, of the, uh, of the uh, tone. And we'll get to it in a moment. But even though in 1475, the, the Pope condemned the accusation, prohibited the worship of Simon as a blessed child, by 1583, the little boy Simon is included in the Catholic liturgical calendar, Martyrologium Romanum, with all the sort of early saints of, and Christian martyrs. On March 24th, it has one sentence that in, uh, in Trent, um, the, um, the, a passion of the, ho uh, of the holy boy Simon uh, by, by, uh, took place, uh, cruelly uh, killed by Jews, um, uh, as multiple sources um, testify to that. So now it, he is now recognized. This is the first case when the Catholic Church recognizes a supposed martyr uh, child uh, supposedly killed by Jews. That's why 1544 is the last official papal condemnation of the accusations. Because now the popes, even if they wanted, and I have evidence that, that in the background uh, over the, the, the centuries, there were efforts to, to help Jews in these various local uh, accusations. They couldn't issue a official condemnation because it would undermine the whole uh, litur liturgical calendar 
all the other sense, if this is wrong, then what else is wrong? 1583, it's after the Reformation, the Catholic Church is being attacked for its worship of saints. Uh, too much is at stake. 1583 is also the... Um, the uh, Gregorian calendar reform. So this is reissued in the new context of the new, um, uh, new calendar as well. Uh, so a lot is going on, but that insertion of Simon into the liturgical calendar explains essentially this map. Why suddenly we have such rise in accusation, and we can see it accusations and uh, and uh, and and trials of Jews, and we can see it because uh, they they say, well, look, Simon, right? The, the Pope has recognized the the that Jews do th such things. Not only that, I mentioned that the iconographic language was um, was invented. But there are cultural differences. And again, that map, in some way, it can also be explained a little bit by these cultural differences. So north of Europe, uh, north of the Alps, in German lands and in Eastern Europe, we have the focus on the cruelty of Jews, on Jews as, as killers, and also on the, um, on the death of, the, uh, of Simon, of the dead body. In Italy, however, they focus more on Simon as a little Christ, as a little saint, um, much less gruesome. Jews are really not there, generally, um, because they are interested in promoting the cult and, and, and affirming the sort of the, the, the decision of the church to include him in, in the calendar. Uh, but here you have examples in, in Northern uh, Europe, in Germany. Um, this is Simon the martyr as the, uh, Simon um, the victim as the dead body. Uh, he was actually painted in one of the uh, entry gates to the city of Frankfurt. Um, you can see this is what was the, the, the fresco, the painting, and you can see the person kind of looking in the gate inside at the painting. Um, so it was used all over uh, Europe in various places. Again, this is also a German uh, publication. Um, this actually, this particular image was entirely forgotten until the 20th century, and I'll get to it in a moment. Uh, th but you can see how ubiquitous these images were, how they were repeated, how they were reused in different chronicles, in different, uh, in different histories. Uh, here you have um, three different editions in different, ta uh, in different towns and, and places. Here you have another uh, example of the use of print, um, and the I iconography that is shaped by, uh, by the story of, of, of Simon. Here you have another one from 1515, um, the same thing. And, and, and it's repeated. This is 19th century, um, uh, as well. Uh, and here you have, uh, an 18th century painting that is found in Poland, right? And note that the, there is always the basin with blood, which is like the, the same one, if you remember from that, uh, Middle Eastern anti-Israeli cartoon where there is a basin of the children in, in blood. So how are facts made? Uh, facts, those rumors that those lies, those stories that have no other support, uh, become facts when they are inserted in these authoritative works of scholarship that people read and trust, um, the histories of the world that have everything. Here's the Ark, uh, uh, Noah's Ark, because it was part of the biblical story, obviously. And in that whole, whole history of the world, from creation until whenever the Chronicle was published, there are about a dozen of, of stories about Jews. But these are the stories that are about Jews. The vocabulary for the readers, European readers, who may not be thinking about Jews at all, who may not be interested in Jews at all, who may want to be just interested in history, is very limited. It only talks about Jews being expelled or persecuted. 
usually for something they did, as a punishment for something they did, or Jews as, as killers, as uh, sacrilegious, as doing nasty things to, uh, to, uh, to Christians. Um, so the, vo the vocabulary is very limited. Here is a Bohemische Chronica, a Bohemian Chronicle of Václav Ochaek Slibochan. And, and again, the same thing. Um, and some of these stories are totally made up, but they are in these, in these authoritative sources, right? So people read and people say, oh, they are Jews are doing this. I didn't know that. And of course, iconography, many of them, uh, the stories about Jews are signaling something. Here you have them bigger than any other um, uh, any other images. This is the story of William of Norwich, the very first tale of Jews supposedly killing Christian children in, in 1144, I mentioned. This is only one sentence about William. This is, this is all the text says. The image is the largest on the page. Here are other stories that are much longer about very prominent church figures, but they get just these little generic images. So there is a, a choice that is made to tell the readers, stop, pay attention. Here is a Protestant uh, scholar, Sebastian Münster, who knew Hebrew, who was a Hebrews, who is publishing his description of the world. And um, this is a, a story of Jews uh, killing um, Christian children, including, he includes Simon. Uh, here's another edition. This is in, um, in Italian. Uh, and this is, again, two examples of how the Jewish stories are signaled for the readers. And here is a, an example of Jews uh, poisoning wells, again, signaling these things to the readers to pay attention. There's something interesting on the page going on. And of course, there's no more authoritative source than your calendar of the lives of, uh, of the li various lives of saints. But how are these tales enforced is, I'll tell you, this is a very interesting story. So here on this page, um, is, uh, here, right here, is, is, a, a, a introduction of a sentence that in 1247, a, a, a girl was found dead in uh, Valreas in southern France, and the Pope issued a, a bull condemning the accusation. And the bull is cited here in full text. This is, a part of the ecclesiastical history. The problem with that was that the, there is a volume, a massive volume for each century of church history. So nobody bought 13, 15, 14 volumes of that big thing. Only a few places, maybe some monastery, maybe some library. So entrepreneurial printers wanted to make money, and what they did is they stripped the primary sources out of the history and only uh, uh, adjusted the uh, little introduction to the primary text. And what we get is in 1240, 1247, Jews killed a girl in Valreas and not mentioning that the Pope condemned it. Right? So stripping the primary sources. And that's how a fact is made, how a story that is entirely opposite becomes another story. A contemporary writer whose book I highly recommend, Georgi Gospodinov, uh, puts in his uh, novel Time Shelter, happiness doesn't make it into history textbooks, nor does it make it into the chronicles and annals. And that's very true. The chronicles that I showed you don't talk about nice stuff. They talk about wars, they talk about that. And the stories about Jews are the nasty stories, right? So again, what you can see that this map can be explained by the recognition of the uh, of the of Simon as a uh, as a person to be worshipped, um, and nonetheless, 
there was a certain process that was in place that in the majority of cases, Jews were still not always, um, I will say they were always persecuted, but they were not always executed as, as punishment. And uh, a historian, um, George Moss, uh, uh, talked about the past as the present and exploring the culture as a state of habit of mind. What these chronicles did is they created a, a way of thinking about Jews that European literate elite Christians began to think about Jews as murderers, as killers, as cruel, as those worthy of expulsions. That's all that was done to Jews, and that's all the Jews did. What we have stripped is we have stripped the Jews as neighbors, as friends, which we see elsewhere in other types of, in other types of sources. In fact, one of my characters from 18th century Poland says, I used to, he goes to uh, Western Europe to study and then he reads these chronicles and said, and he comes back and said, I used to go and drink at Jewish inns and with Jews. I'm surprised I'm still alive. I had no idea they did it, right? So these elite sources create a certain lens through which suddenly Jews are viewed. Modern uses of these pre-modern stories. So again, sort of circling back to where we started, how did we get to the to San Diego through this? So these, again, these chronicles created these facts that scholars and later readers could say, well, look, it says that in so, that, in, in that, that year, Jews did this and that. In 1934, the Nazis the, um, issued uh, in their really uh, un, uh, hugely anti-Semitic rag, their Sturmer, devoted a whole issue to the ritual murder. And, uh, and here they, they show this um, this uh, image of Jews, you can see the uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, and then essentially the basin that then you, could, you remember from the uh, anti-Israeli cartoon, and all these supposed ch uh, children that that were killed. But what they did inside, and you might recognize some images, they used literally the sources that I was using for my pre-modern, medieval, early modern book, who, who will care about it? Uh, they used the images that were published in the sixth, 15th century. They used the um, uh, sort of annals-like chronology um, in brackets. I don't know whether you can see, but after each year, they have a, a source, a footnote, going back to these to these authoritative sources in this chronicle, in the lives of saints, in the uh, in the liturgical calendar, that's what Jews did. They affirmed these quote unquote facts as the uh, as if they were uh, true. And then once once they introduced this iconography, once they reintroduced, that's when that image enters circulation. Nobody knows it after 1493, but it re-enters circulation. And now we see it in the Italian fascist um, publication, La Difesa della Razza, the same thing. And here you have the Simon of Trent um, image. Then during, at the height of the final solution, they, um, they publish scholarly books like Helmut Schramm, the Jewish Ritual Mord, the Ju Jewish Ritual Murder, again, republishing the pre-modern chronicles and images. They published it in also in Polish and in Ukrainian, again, to, uh, to justify, to uh, poison the, um, the uh, uh, knowledge and any kind of perhaps uh, empathy that may have been, if at, if there was at all, uh, about Jews, and that then er enters the contemporary neo-Nazi uh, reservoir of knowledge. Right? They don't read Cesare Baronio. They don't read the Nuremberg Chronicle. They don't read any other stuff. They take this 
from the Nazi sources that are then translated and put online and are then distributed. Um, the, that's where the Middle East gets their iconography. And in fact, one of the, uh, one of the Nazi propagandists moved to Egypt and, um, and converted to Islam and served in the, um, anti-Israeli, uh, Arab propaganda early on. The killer in San Diego did not read all these scholarly books or other ones. He used the Nazi and neo-Nazi and then translated online, uh, propaganda. So I'm wrapping up. Are there any lessons to be learned? Leadership matters. It may not be fully effective, right? But in, in fact, it does matter when leaders speak up, when they make statements. It gives um, tools to fight back for people below them. Um, conversely, if, pe if leaders say something that is horrible, it helps justify um, uh, uh, actions of, for those who want to. Diverse sources of knowledge matter. This map can also be in, uh, explained by the diverse sources. Know that the majority of it is in, in Eastern Europe, what used to be Poland, Lithuania. There is one case in sort of Alsatia and a couple of cases in, um, in, in Italy. Um, the uh, Germans had those nasty images I showed you, but they also had scholars who were studying Hebrew texts and who had knowledge of Jewish, um, Jewish practices, uh, who were able to say, nah, Jews don't do that. Christians like, uh, Johannes Buchstorf wrote a whole book about the Jewish uh, rites and ceremonies. And when he talks about Passover and Passover matzah, he says, and um, it is made of only flour and water. And then he adds, and it doesn't taste good. Uh, but it's a subtle way for him to say, no, they don't add blood, right? And he talks about that, uh, all these different practices. Um, so the Christian scholars were able to say, no, this is stupid. This is not, not happening. In Italy, they were far more interested in converting Jews and proving to Jews from Jewish sources that Jesus was the Messiah, that then they were interested in um, condemning Jewish practices in any way. So there is a whole uh, genre of literature which literally uses Hebrew works, rabbinic works, to prove that Jesus was the Messiah to try to convert Jews. In Poland, However, there are no Hebrew scholars. There's no knowledge of Jewish um, literature, uh, Jewish works and rabbinic writings. And what the Polish writers do is they repeat in Polish, they translate these chronicles. And these chronicles just cast Jews as killers worthy of any kind of punishment. So when a Polish reader would read about Jews, he would see Jews as these horrible uh, people. And in fact, it is the people who don't read books in Poland and in, in Eastern Europe who come to the defense of Jews. It's the people who know Jews as neighbors, who Christian women who may serve in Jewish homes, uh, who come say, no, Jews don't do such things. But it is the elites, the intellectuals, the, uh, the those who read this, who are saying, no, but look at these books. That's what they do. There's a dead child. Jews must have done it. And that's what explains that mass. Visual culture matters. The little angelic boys do not cause such accusations and animosity but presenting Jews as killers will create a certain image. And one last thing I want to say that there was no uninterrupted line from the pre-modern period until, until the neo-Nazis and Nazis and other um, modern cases like uh, you'll hear from Hillel Kieval. Uh, but it was the modern interest in pre-modern sources that reintroduces them to modern readers. So the publications of the various chronicles that starts in the 19th century for the modern historians that they begin to note is the stories.
And then in the modern accusations, historians and other activists who are defending Jews uh, begin to look into the pre-modern evidence to prove that Jews don't do such things when accusations such as the Damascus affair in 1840 or the Tisa Eslar blood libel in 1882 or the uh, Hilsner affair in Polna uh, result in the republication of these various defenses of, uh, of Jews that are happening that I found in the archives in the pre-modern period. And the Bayless affair, of course, as well, produced a lot of the scholarship and a lot of the sources. And the anti, uh, and here is, um, uh, Cecil Roth publishing uh, the, uh, 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 an 18th century document uh, 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 arguing that uh, and, and proving for, by a cardinal that Jews do not such things. But the anti-Semites do that too. And Roth did it in response to this issue. The anti-Semites do that too. They go to the archives and historical sources and say, look, there are all these trials that Jews were condemned. So we can see that they uh, they do that. Um, so the again the the hate field manifesto doesn't come from directly from the pre modern era, but it has roots in the way the story has been told through chronicles has been included in these authoritative scholarly and also historical sources that turn these libels, these lies, these tales, these rumors into facts motivating anti-Semites for centuries. So thank you very much.